you very much, Ian, for the introduction and uh, thanks to the CLS and the UEC. Uh, I'm honored and uh, thrilled to receive this award. And I inquired before my talk um, what this talk should be about. And uh, the answer that I received was basically should be a talk to a general user audience of synchron users, not specialists in our techniques that we are using. And <clears throat> this is what I'm going to uh, talk about. Um, why does this not? Okay, there we go. My outline is I will start to explain what our techniques uh, are probing, and then I will straight dive into the examples from the three research areas we are active in. 2D materials, I will talk about silicene. There's nothing about graphene, which we also work on, and semiconductors, I talk about how we study defects. And then we, I am going to talk a little bit about uh, phosphor converted LED materials and some nitride phosphors, and I conclude with uh, some acknowledgements. Um, what do our soft X ray techniques probe? As you all know, that, uh, uh, and it's shown here as an excerpt from the X ray data booklet, is that the binding energies of the electrons in different elements are characteristic for each element and also for the orbital. And if you now know that the outer electrons are responsible for almost all properties of a, any material, <clears throat> then it is clear that if you have access to study uh, these outer electrons, then you have access to all these parameters. And these parameters include such different um, parameters like the color, the chemical bonding, magnetism, band gap, hardness, luminescence. And I'm sure if you have any additional parameters and you would like to add them to this list, they also would be likely governed by the outer electrons. So the key for all of this is then, of course, the tunability of the synchro radiation that allows us uh, with the energy to tune in to uh, specific electrons and specific elements and specific orbitals and even specific sites. And what I mean by site is the following. <clears throat> Um, as I said, we can tune to a specific element because of the binding energy specificity uh, um, characteristic. Um, we can tune to orbitals and we can also tune to different non-equivalent sites. And what's shown here in the uh, measurement window or the, in the graph is that uh, the sample cytosine, which is a building block of DNA, one of the four building blocks, you see absorption spectra going across the carbon 1S or K edge. And in the little insert, you see the four non-equivalent uh, carbon atoms uh, labeled one, two, three, and four. And when you look now at the um, absorption spectrum, you see that the four non-equivalent sites each give rise to uh, the corresponding numbers and the peaks here um, that um, correspond to the pi star resonances, one as to pi star transitions of the four non-equivalent um, sites. I just want to get my laser pointer, okay. Um, how we do this is, of course, with the help of CLS, we use an undulator beamline at Rikes. Um, we have a monochromator that picks out the energy that we would like to have impinging on the sample. And of the multitude of processes that are happening, we focus on basically two. Uh, one is the absorbed uh, um, photons, and the other one are the emitted photons that are uh, monitored by a diffraction grading spectrometer. And then our emission and absorption spectra can be, and inelastic X ray scattering spectra can be related to all these properties that I mentioned before. Now, I wanted to quickly zoom in a little bit on what is it that absorption and emission spectroscopy uh, exactly probe. So, what is shown here is on the energy axis, the band structure calculated for um, the gamma phase of germanium nitride. Uh, on the left side is in the projected density of states. In other words, this uh, spectrum here of two different uh, broadenings. You note that the energy here, the energy axis is broken because the binding energy is about 400 electron volts of the uh, nitrogen 1S. So this is a, at the nitrogen, uh, these are the nitrogen, the two uh, nitrogen 1S electrons. So what happens now when you uh, bring in synchro radiation from the monochromator, you excite it when you tune the energy properly, 
to the uh, conduction band from the 1S to the conduction band. And that is why the XAS probes the unoccupied partial density of states by you now by tuning the energy higher or lower, you can uh, uh, probe this entire conduction band or in other words, the unoccupied states. Now we have an excited system where we have a missing uh, core hole. And now two things can happen. You can of course have the same electron that was excited go down. This gives rise to the uh, to be monitored by the other end station at right, the elastic scattering end station. And in our case, um, what would happen if we have an electron from the valence band now uh, coming down and uh, filling that core hole, then uh, an unlikely but um, still important process is that uh, the energy will be released via a, an outgoing photon. And this outgoing photon we detect in the spectrometer. And therefore, this so-called X-ray emission spectrum uh, would then monitor directly the um, valence band density of states, in other words, the occupied partial density of states. And if you ask yourself, this, uh, what is the difference between the two graphs, other than the principle that I'm showing, is that this is a ground state calculation here that we see. And uh, that is because in the final state, the core hole has been filled and uh, this is a ground state property. And when you do the same calculation for the same system, gamma germanium nitride, and you include a missing electron here, the core hole, then this will lead to this much denser blue uh, spaghetti instead of a rather defined uh, density of states here. So the difference between the two graphs is ground state and core hole. So in other words, for the absorption spectroscopy, one needs to include the core hole, and this needs to be taken into account in the uh, calculations. When we now put it all together, so we look at the um, core hole calculation here, um, the blue spectrum, then uh, this is this calculated spectrum and the emission spectrum corresponding to this valence band density of states um, is this spectrum. So you see then, uh, this is now for, again for germanium nitride, you see the emission and the calculated absorption here in purple for the um, um, for the uh, for the um, the ground state calculation and here for the core hole calculation. So the blue and the blue one and the red one resemble then very well the measured spectra. And I should mention that this all this is more governed by the dipole selection rule <coughs> delta L plus or minus one. So now I wanted to zoom before I zoom in on the research examples. I wanted to stress that um, when we look at a certain system, an important point is always what uh, kind of agreement between calculation and experiment can one expect. So what is calculated here, the first thing to note is we are calculating spectra and we are measuring spectra. This is important because the calculation of spectra holds more information than indirect calculations say as uh, total energy, formation energy, bond length, potential energy surfaces and partial dose. So, this is, in my opinion, a big advantage of uh, what we are doing. And what we are calculating here is shown in uh, the form of Fermi's golden rule. So we take not only the density of states, which is shown here, we also uh, take the, or calculate the quantum mechanical dipole, dipole matrix element for the transition. And this gives rise, as shown here for three samples, tin nitride, germanium nitride, and silicon nitride. This gives a stellar agreement because the uh, structures are known from extra diffraction typically, and we can then obtain, if we model the system correctly, near perfect agreement. You see that here in all details, the spectra are reproduced. So this is the case when the structure is uh, well known. Um, a little bit different case occurs when we have to basically feed in assumptions and, and, and uh, yeah, assumption and structures that are not uh, exactly determined. So this is an example for graphene oxide. We have less perfect agreement. What you see here then, of course, that you have to, the, the whole system, when you look at this system, you have to calculate all the uh, spectra of all these sites. Then you have to add them all up and to make a long story short here, then when you compare the red spectrum, which is the uh, overlay of all these different calculations that you see on the right side, and you compare to the black spectrum, the uh, for graphene oxide, the uh, 
measured absorption, then the agreement is quite good, but not as stellar as in the case when the structures are known. So this is always uh, good to keep in the back of your mind, the level of agreement scales with how well is the input to the density function codes known, which is the structure and the space group. I need to uh, briefly also introduce one other technique, resonant inelastic scattering. So this is described in the, by Kramer's Heisenberg formula. The key point here is that um, resonant inelastic scattering is what I would call a, a one-step process. And you, you have an incoming soft X-ray photon, typically at one edge, in this case here near the nitrogen edge. And now what happens is in a one-step process, the energy of the photon is diminished typically by a few energy uh, electron volts, and this is called the energy loss. So you have incoming radiation, the outgoing radiation is a little bit diminished by a few EV. The way this is described here is by the uh, transition from the initial to the intermediate state. So in this case, one again promotes a nitrogen, a one S-hole to the conduction band, this again is only in terms of the calculation, the breakdown and the and the steps, and then in the transition intermediate to final state, you have a valence band electron filling in the calculation the uh, previously existing core or created core hole. And when you look at the net transition, the difference between the initial state and the final state, then the only thing that appears is in difference. It looks as if a, an electron from the valence band has been promoted to the conduction band. And this is then called the net transition and gives rise to the uh, energy loss of, again, a few EV. I thought it would be helpful um, for those who are not familiar with the techniques to make a brief uh, overview. What are the parameters that the techniques can probe? So I stress now that different elements, of course, is common to all three techniques, absorption, emission, and inelastic scattering, the orbitals, the sites we discussed, the occupied partial density of states or valence band probed by emission, unoccupied by absorption. If you combine the two on a common energy scale, then you can determine the band gap. RICS also allows you determine, to determine um, whether the band gap is direct or indirect. And then we have a number of um, what I would call fundamental excitations within the material, like charge transfer, inner shell transitions like DD, FF, or valence to conduction band excitations, magnons and orbitons. And if you have really good resolution, typically not uh, as stellar at, uh, at our right streamline, you could also even probe phonons. Again, these here, are, these last four are all um, governed or, or measured by an energy loss. Okay, now let's dive into the research examples. So the first uh, topic I wanted to talk briefly about some interesting results is silicene. And the question that we are asking is, is a two-dimensional material, is it a metal or is it a semiconductor? So what is silicene? Silicene is essentially, if you take graphene, a monolayer of carbon, and you replace all the carbon atoms with silicon atoms in this typical famous hexagonal orientation or arrangement, uh, then you get silicine. This was observed for the first time in 2012. And the question arose immediately, does silicine have a band gap? Why this is important is that uh, graphene is one of the best conductors we know. And ideally, when you want to use uh, materials for electronics, you need ideally a band gap, or for example, for solar cells and whatnot. Many uh, electronic applications require a band gap. And so the question or the original idea was, since silicon is a semiconductor with a famous band gap and one of the best studied materials, the question was, is it maybe that we can just switch from the, uh, the structure from, from graphene to silicine and introduce a band gap? So that is our main question. The other questions we wanted to also verify the correct structure by comparing to our calculations. Then we will, I will also talk about what happens when one can grow multi layers of silicine, so several layers of uh, silicon, and how does it oxidize? Let's look now at the uh, first, um, the silicon monolayers on uh, silver 111. Um, so the first thing to note is unlike graphene, 
silicon, uh, silicine is uh, a little bit buckled, not entirely flat. Here you see the side view, here you see the top view, the typical hexagonal structure or no silicon atoms, but it is buckled. And this is also the reason why freestanding uh, silicine to date has not been uh, produced or synthesized. So um, the two structures that have been realized um, and, and suggested for silicine on silver 111 are the following two. Here in B, we have uh, silicon 3x3 three three on silver 111 4x4. Four that is uh, the main structure. And then these are only slightly different structures um, where the uh, silicine is slightly oriented by different angles. So I make D through E, I consider this in, for the rest of the talk as, uh, as one structure. So there's the difference is how does one orient the silicine on the uh, silver 111 substrate. So the structures that I refer to are now the first one is called three by three on four by four, and the other one I don't have to go through this here is the seven by seven I call it over thirteen by thirteen. Um, this is also close to my heart um, because it was the first samples at CLS that we grew ourselves. Typically, we get our samples uh, from uh, collaborators to synthesize the sample. In this case, because it had to be grown in house and directly without breaking vacuum transferred into our measurement chamber. So Neil, the student, uh, learned how to grow uh, the structure and how to verify it using lead. Let's look first at our calculations before we compare to the measurements. So what you see here is um, when you have freestanding silicine, again, this is only possible to do on the computer. You don't uh, have a gap. When uh, you look at freestanding silicine now, but in the structure three by three four over four by four silver. Again, this is a, an artificial structure that only can be produced on the computer because it is a structure on the substrate, but now you have removed the substrate. This is in a reality not possible. Then you have a, a gap, a, a small gap introduced, but as soon as you introduce the silver here, three by three on four by four on silver, there is no gap. And the same thing happens for the other structure. If you have this removed structure without the substrate, there is, which doesn't exist in reality, there is a gap. And again, there's no gap when um, you look at the structure on silver. So as soon as you bring silicine on silver, the gap in the calculation disappears. Um, now we compare this to our measurements. So here are the, uh, on the left side, the emission and right side absorption measurements. Here are two reference samples silicon dioxide and pure silicon. And here are the measurements for silicine in blue. Most importantly, you see the overlap here because uh, we, I, the, um, the energy axis, you see that the uh, valence and conduction bands are overlapping. So bo bottom line is this is remains a metallic sample. And when we compare to the three different structures, freestanding, again, only a theoretical structure, not successfully synthesized today. And the other two structures, you see that there's good agreement between the absorption and emission measurements and calculations. Um, so for all the structures that we calculated, um, it turned out that as soon as you bring in the silver uh, substrate, there is no band gap and no uh, Dirac cone and silicine is metallic. Also contrary to um, graphene due to the strong silver and silicon interaction, this is relatively strong, while in graphene, it is almost non-existent. And now the next question was suggested that um, one could grow multi-layers, and this would be a feasible way of introducing a band gap. Um, the case is here that uh, we have now calculated bilayers here of uh, silicine, and it turns out that for the freestanding uh, bilayer, one has a gap, but as soon as you bring in, as previously, the silver, there's no gap. So again, and uh, the same held true no gap for the uh, second structure. So what we saw before holds true again, even for the bilayer. And uh, then when we continue to add more layers, and this is now shown here again, emission absorption and uh, for silicon dioxide. And now we grow monolayer, uh, bilayer, triple layer. 
The point is that we see a gradual evolution here. The blue spectrum is by silicon. We see a gradual evolution from silly, uh, seeing the monolayer to bulk silicon. So when you exceed about three monolayer, uh, three monolayers or three layers, then it, uh, the spectra uh, resume those of um, bulk silicon. Another way that was suggested is when one could use uh, the oxidation of silicine to introduce a gap due to the fact that uh, silic uh, silicon dioxide has a large uh, gap, plus action insulator. Um, so what we see here is this is the pristine uh, silicine spectrum, and then uh, even under 10 to minus 9 tau in our measurement chambers, so ultra high vacuum conditions, gradually over time, there is modest oxidation. Again, this all did not uh, um, lead to an opening of a gap, and the, uh, mon the monolayer in this case remained metallic. And even if you expose it entirely to air and ambient conditions, which you see here, then this resembles the spectrum, of course, of silicon dioxide. So, in other words, uh, the oxidation is uh, the oxidation is again not a feasible way of introducing a band gap in silicon. Now I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about defects in semiconductors. So, the first system that I wanted to introduce is indium dioxide uh, doped with or indium oxide doped with iron, and our samples were. Uh, PLD grown thin films of indium oxide doped with three different dopant levels of iron grown on uh, aluminum oxide. The key point is that all our uh, samples exhibited uh, room temperature ferromagnetism and had different uh, saturation magnetizations. And the question that we were after is what is the origin of the room temperature ferromagnetism? This is an important question in spin electronic materials. So then we had, a, first of all, a unique setup in the sense that um, this is the indium, the uh, iron doped indium grown on the substrate, and the incoming photons were scanned across the iron L23 edge. But as the outgoing signal, we monitored the visible luminescence, 689 nanometers, of the aluminum substrate. This is a nifty way of measuring true absorption spectrum, much like uh, a transmission spectrum of a thin film. Typically, thin films of this thickness are not freestanding and difficult to do. So this was the first thing we obtain true absorption spectra in order to then uh, being able, uh, be able to calculate those. So these are the uh, what I would call raw data. Um, the iron L23 edge spectra for the three different iron concentrations plus one spectrum for indium oxide powder without any iron in it. And the first thing we see is that, of course, the intensity scales with the amount of roughly uh, of iron. That's no surprise. And the more important part is that the spectral shape show, uh, changes between uh, the doping level. And we therefore have varying uh, degrees of Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. And um, then, uh, in a nifty way, uh, Robert at the time uh, deconvoluted or created these component spectra. So the idea, the underlying idea is there's only two components uh, of iron in the present in the sample, Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. And these are what we call the two component spectra for a black Fe2 plus and orange Fe3 plus. And how well is that really the case, uh, or is it confirmed? Um, here are the three spectra for the three uh, different doping levels. And uh, now we have always the spectra composed out of two linear combinations of the Fe2 plus amount and Fe3 plus amount. And you see that this agrees very well. So the, this assumption is correct. And now the key point is to do uh, an less impurity uh, model calculation for among many structures that were tested, these are the two best uh, theoretical spectra. So we see we have to now compare the Fe2 plus here, the black uh, between experiment and uh, um, theory. Uh, the black one is the normal Fe2 plus that one would also find in a sample like FeO. But the yellow spectrum, the Fe3 plus, is a unique spectrum in the sense 
that uh, gives, of course, the best agreement. And uh, it is unique in the sense that it is first of all FE3 plus, it second of all sits in the uh, indium side of indium oxide. And thirdly, and most importantly, it has an adjacent oxygen vacancy. So this is a very specific FE3 plus spectrum. The same finding was confirmed um, when we did uh, also RICS measurements, these were the absorption measurements, and the same finding is uh, confirmed here. You see in blue, the spectrum agrees with a yellow curve, which is mainly Fe3 plus with Fe3 plus with this adjacent vacancy that I just mentioned. And then, for example, for the green spectrum, we have predominantly the Fe2 plus spectrum. And the key thing, so this is two confirmations of the same theoretical model. And the, the key point is now we want to link this to the magnetization of the system. So what is shown here in this curve is the iron concentration and the three different iron concentrations we had. And here is now the valence concentration of the specific Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. And you see for Fe2 plus the black uh, curve of the three different concentration points. And then Fe3 plus of the yellow one, uh, of the um, so yeah, yellow one and or orange one. And here on the right side, we see now the curve for the different concentration, how the uh, magnetization saturation changes. And it turns out that the uh, Fe3 plus follows the trend of the magnetization, which is an indication that the Fe3 plus. Uh, sites are actually the ones that are governing or uh, are governing the magnetism, the room temperature ferromagnetism. So um, what, why this is important is now this is the first direct evidence that a specific subset of uh, Fe3 plus ions that are in uh, the substitution in your places and that have an adjacent oxygen vacancies. Those are the ones that uh, are responsible for the uh, room temperature ferromagnetism. Um, one more word about a different system, saying silicon N2, about how we detect uh, defects is the following. Um, so we see here the uh, calculated and measured nitrogen KH spectra. We see here the uh, absorption with the calculation for here we uh, have we often monitor for different levels of core hole uh, concentration. And the point is now that we have uh, measured uh, the zero spectra X-ray excited optical luminescence. So with an optical spectrometer, you monitor the at high excitation energies, you monitor the luminescence spectrum, and this can be deconvoluted in a number of peaks. There are a total of three Gaussians here uh, that create the fit. And from the experiment, we have determined that the band gap is 4.7. And now the question is, what are these uh, um, luminescence levels due to? And so there are two uh, deep level defects that we found using the from the zero spectrum. And the first point is that the lowest features Two point this is the blue one, 2.11 and 2.56. These two add up when you add up these energies uh, to exactly the measured band gap. And what this is an indication of is that um, this, this is likely uh, the case that um, there is possible radiative, radiative decay from the conduction band to the trapped state and then from the trapped state to the valence band. So what is shown here in this model and the calculations, we have the pristine and black uh, zinc silicon nitride, and now we have two non-equivalent sites where we have created nitrogen vacancies. And this gives rise to these additional states in the uh, band gap. So these are inter-gap states, and they are the ones that give rise to the uh, luminescence within the band gap. And the calculations also confirmed our band gap. And uh, also the calculations then confirmed this model of how one can monitor or study uh, defects. Now I wanted to switch gears again to the last topic, and that is um, how, to how we measure uh, 5D energies in uh, phosphors. And um, the motivation uh, is that um, these new materials are used in highly efficient phosphor converted light emitting diodes and the energy saving 
are gigantic if one were to replace all incandescent light bulbs with um, modern PC LEDs. Um, and so the, um, the the important number here is that when you um, it has been calculated that the world's electrical energy consumption, 20% of that goes into lighting or is used for lighting. And this would be reduced to 5% if one would do what I just said, replacing all the light bulbs with the more energy efficient ones. So this would be a gigantic savings. So this is a relatively uh, hot topic. Now I have the problem. I want to basically not mention the systems that we are exactly measuring. I want to say that uh, the next three slides I will glance over very quickly. Um, the point is that we have very structurally similar nitride samples where we only change a few, a few atoms. Um, they are structurally very similar, but in terms of the luminescence problems, uh, properties, they are very different. So what I'm showing here is that uh, what, what all these structures have in common, you have these nitrogen corner sharing um, tetrahedra, and they are arranged with these uh, different alkaline earth and other atoms um, packed into the structure. These are all, uh, the, the, yeah, I want to quickly go over this if there are questions uh, later on. So one can substitute now say strontium here, one can substitute magnesium and aluminum. If there are questions, we have always, I, I refer to these as SMS, SLA, and two more system, BNSA, CLMS. Again, the point is not what these are. We can go back to this for discussion. The point is they are all structurally very similar. Only a few atoms are replaced, but they lead to very different um, luminescence properties. And this is why this is all tunable. So I wanted to now uh, briefly uh, show you um, the properties of the europium luminescence. So these are europium doped nitrides and the ground state and europium 2 plus is 5D0. So the luminescence that is now used in the uh, phosphor converted Lidomatic diodes is the 5D to 4F luminescence. So as shown here, this would be laying both the 5D as well as the 4F lay in the uh, band gap. And these are therefore, again, intra-gap transitions. Uh, it is also interesting that because of the uh, um, ground state of 5D0 of europium 2 plus, the initial state is an excited state. So the point is now that in order to develop new materials with better uh, properties for uh, lighting applications, and it's crucial to know where the energy position of the 5D is, and ideally even using calculations being able to predict it. Speaking of calculations, this is a difficult problem because we have two gigantic open shells, the 4F7 and the 5D1, 4F6, and this results in extremely large matrices uh, of these many elements, and therefore these calculations are very rare and also very difficult. How does one, uh, first of all, I need to stress two more points. The energy position of the European 5D here is now very much tunable due to the selection of the host material. This is key thing, a, a key aspect. And this is due to two effects. I will not go into this, but it is desirable because the tunable luminescence then allows us to uh, have different color rendering index, which is CRI, so you can tune the, the, the color of the, the emitted light. So again, 5D to 4F is the luminescence transition, and we have strong tunability of the 5D levels, very much different from the very localized and non-tunable 4F levels. How does one measure the um, typically the uh, um, 5D energy position? This is done by uh, monitoring the thermal quenching. So it turns out when you take any kind of phosphor and you uh, measure the luminescence with increasing temperature, it turns out that the phosphors all quench or the luminescence decreases. It is due to the fact that the 5D levels are residing relatively close to the conduction band and with increasing temperature, you now depopulate the 5D levels, that those are the ones where you want to uh, have your luminescence from, you depopulate them by exciting them through thermal excitation to the conduction band. That is why it quenches, and this is a, a simple model then um, can be used to look at the depopulation. So there are two fitting parameters in the A and delta E, and delta E is now the energy between the 5D level and the conduction band. So thermal excitation 
depopulates uh, the 5D levels. Um, I show here a few simulations for this, how this decays. I should say that the delta E and the A are not entirely independent. Why uh, would one need another method if this already works so well? The, the reason is that often you have imperfect uh, phosphors, especially when you start with new materials, and they have, of course, um, defects and these defects lead to uh, trapping of electrons and therefore reduce luminescence again. The technique that I'm going to show how we measure the 5D energy position is independent of the quality of the sample. That's the advantage. So now I wanted to quickly uh, show you um, how we do this. Um, this is now used uh, with, uh, um, we use the RICS for this. So what is shown here is uh, three different samples in different colors and always two different excitation energies, two different uh, emission spectra. So this is shown here, then you want to orient yourself, you have the three different systems and the gray lines show now the excitation energies that we choose right at the onset of the promotion of a nitrogen or an S electron to the conduction band. So now what we do next is we want to zoom in now to something that you're probably not as used to. Um, we want to zoom into a much smaller energy window. This is all understood fluorescence here. We don't need to uh, look at this. We want to zoom in a much smaller energy range around the elastic peak. And we want to convert this emission energy scale to the energy loss scale. And this is done by subtracting the emission energy and subtracting for each case the energy of the excitation incoming photon energy. This leads to this graph. So again, two different excitation energies always for the two different uh, spectra per system. So again, these are always two, uh, two times the same sample. So the first thing I would like you to uh, um, appreciate because you might ask why do these uh, experiments look like uh, subatomic particle physics experiments? And the answer is that uh, these are actually the most photon hungry or difficult um, experiments I've encountered, the reason is threefold. The first thing is, if you look here where you excite, you excite actually just below or at the conduction band edge. So we have basically no efficiency of dumping photons or energy in the material. That's the first problem. The next problem is that you have a doping concentration of europium 2 plus of about 1%. And then finally, the transition probability for the transition is also extremely small. So this gives an insanely small uh, cross-section for the total experiment. That is why these spectra here look uh, noisy. Now we see two uh, features here. We see an elastic peak and fit uh, to it is the, uh, an inelastic peak. Um, the energy loss of this inelastic cyan peak here is always the strongest when exciting at the lower of the two excitation energies. And interesting enough, we have here an undoped sample. When you have an undoped sample without europium, then there is no loss feature at the low energy excitation. And that is indicating that the loss feature, this cyan loss feature here, is due to uh, europium 2 plus. Now, the question obviously is um, which fundamental excitation leads to these small energy losses? And what is shown here now, from the fits on this graph here, we see for the two fits for the elastic peak and here more importantly the inelastic feature, the cyan feature, we see for the always for the two uh, the samples and the two different excitation energies, the peak width for the inelastic peak. The first thing to notice, this is roughly constant, which is good because this is the reality in the experiment and uh, that the width of the incoming beam is the same. And then we see for the lower excitation energy that the, uh, which was related to the Europium 2 plus, we see different energy losses. And the question is, what is this due to? And we interpret this as the energy losses as being due to the excitation of a 5D to the conduction uh, band excitation. So therefore, this is, gives us direct means in an alternative method of uh, measuring the 5D levels with respect to the um, conduction band. And now when we compare to the other method, the thermal quenching method, which is shown here, then we see that for this and this sample, 
the and there's a relatively good agreement within the error bar. So this is, gives us further uh, belief that um, this is indeed the energy loss is due to the 5D2 conduction band excitation. What is also interesting uh, is this, that um, when you now look at the spectra, the visible luminescence spectra, and you excite at the europium edge, then you see features that you would otherwise never see in um, optical spectroscopy. So these again are the 5D 24F uh, transitions that we use in the phosphor, but these features are typically not seen. So this feature B is just a ligand hole uh, to for a, a filling of a ligand hole from the 4F. And this is also interesting. I've not seen this before in emission. This is the undoped sample, and this is directly the conduction band um, to valence band transition, or the in luminescence, the decay valence band, uh, uh, conduction band to uh, valence band. So when we put it all together, then um, we see that we now can, for these other three different samples, here are the exact sample compositions given. Again, the four systems that I've shown you. Um, we see that all the uh, levels are de uh, determined. So the 5D conduction band was, as I just have shown, determined from RICS. The valence band was determined from XCS, the conduction band from XAS, the 5D 4F7 from Zeol, and also uh, these transitions from Zeol. So this gives rise to a completely determined energy scale, which is important for the application of these materials. We have done this uh, on one other system, which I wanted to quickly show. And we found the same thing again. So we have done uh, one, uh, done one more, sys uh, two more systems, and found again a good agreement with the 5D to conduction band uh, determination from thermal quenching, and from our RICS data. Now the last thing I wanted to show you is one interesting aspect. And that is uh, when we want to calculate these, the, uh, this is the spectrum that I, the graph that I've just shown. And here are the three different um, luminescence features that are used in calculations and uh, that we want to calculate. The problem is now that um, this is the feature that you use in your phosphor. And when you have only one feature, there's, it's very difficult to tune any calculation parameters because that's the height of the peak, which is basically pointless since it is anyhow, there's never an agreement between experiment and calculation. There's a, always a proportionality factor. And of course, then the only other parameter is the width, the energy position, as you know, for the energies will never come out correctly for these energies. So this is one problem, and um, this is uh, due to the uh, specific and, and uh, yeah, to the speci special character of europium 2 plus. When you look at presidium 3 plus, this is actually not the case. You have a rich spectrum, and all these features can be used to then tune calculation. Here's our calculation here, our measurement, to tune your parameters, which would not be possible here. And the reason why this is, and this is uh, uh, the interesting thing that I want to stress, so here is shown the energy for the different lanthanides. Unfortunately, I found only this table for lanthanum 3 plus. So you need to make the three, little transfer for europium 2 plus, 2 plus will now be at gadolinium because we look at europium 2 plus. It's a very unique system, which has this one and also only cerium 3 plus are the only ones, in my opinion, that have technical relevance in the sense that here you can see directly only the transition to the um, to the ground state level. So that's why I'm saying technologically most relevant for the PC LEDs are Cerium 3 plus and European 2 plus, because then you don't have all this stuff on other cases. For example, let's look at this. You have the decay from the 5D to all the other 4F multiplets. In the case of Europium 2 plus, the other four of multiplets are uh, residing above the uh, 5D. So this is why this is important. And we are currently working on the calculation. This is uh, Tristan that many, who many of you know, is uh, approaching this. So what you see here, we use a different code, ADF. It's a relatively long and complex calculation. So here we have an experiment for our first test system, the system for Europium 2 plus. This is the only calculation that I'm aware of from a reference, and here's what Tristan is calculating using ADF. So in short, we will be, and within half a year, so we will also be able to then have predictive power as to how does one need to tune the 
um, host matrix to change the luminescent features. I wanted to quickly leave you with this slide, the acknowledgements. Um, I wanted to stress what a fantastic job Teak Boyko is doing. He's the b scientist for our inelastic end station. And here are the people who were involved in uh, all the measurements I've shown. Thank you very much.